All right. <laughs> Welcome to all of you. If you would remain standing, I will ask Circuit Judge Russell Roberts to join us and lead us rather in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Please be seated and welcome to the 2022 Larry G. Smith Specialism Award Ceremony. As you know, we hold this in conjunction with Law Day Week every year, uh, and we thank everybody for being with us. Let me introduce to you uh, the judges who uh, are with us, and we all find this very important to uh, attend and support this function. Uh, certainly, you know everybody in the box, but I did want to point them out, Circuit Judge Elijah Smiley, and I did want to point out it is Judge Smiley, it was on Judge Smiley's watch that this award came into being, uh, Circuit Judge Anna Garcia, a Bay County Judge, Judge Grammer, Circuit Judge Brandon Young, and Circuit Judge Russell Roberts, Circuit Judge Bill Henry, and Bay County Judge Tim Campbell. Uh, we could not, thank you, uh, and uh, there may very well be more of us filing in here late, so my apologies on behalf of them, uh, as I know a couple of them are in court and did want to be with us. Uh, I do want to recognize uh, the professionalism committee that brings us here today. This is important to note. This is a bar presentation. We as judges have nothing to do with the selection of the recipients, and it is important that we keep it that way. Uh, but I did want to recognize uh, Maria Dykes, local uh, attorney, Ms. Holly Meltzer, likewise, a local attorney, Mr. Brian Liebrick, uh, local counsel, and Mr. Jason White, uh, likewise, local counsel. All of them have worked very hard on this uh, project and program and have done so for the last several years. And so we thank all of you for we're doing that. Uh, I did want to, at this time, uh, we have traditionally had uh, out of circuit speakers come. Last year, we did something different. And we asked instead some people that have expertise within the 14th Judicial Circuit to talk about professionalism and how it may have uh, been seen uh, as they were beginning their practice how it may have changed throughout the life of their practice and perhaps to gain some wisdom from what they have seen as the rest of us are practicing. And so uh, we have elected this year at the request of certainly the, um, the bar members to ask a local attorney, uh, Mr. J. Robert Hughes, to present uh, his thoughts on the circuit, the growth, life of this circuit and the professionalism in this circuit. So at this time, if I could ask uh, Mr. Hughes, if you would come forward and favor us some more. Thank you, sir. Just please speak into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Um, Chief Judge Patterson, judges, members of the bar and um, distinguished guests, uh, it's an honor for me to be, we've been asked to make a few remarks, and it is a few remarks. It's, I'm not going to be here up here for a long time, even though Holly told me I only had 10 or 15 minutes. You tell that to a lawyer, and that is ridiculous, you know, had, had me, but I'm going to do the best I can. But this is an important occasion. Um, Holly uh, Mels is on the committee, and apparently they decided, as she said to me, they wanted one of the old guys to speak. <laughs> so... 
you can tell by looking, I'm one of the old guys. Um, and there are fewer and fewer of us uh, as we look around. Um, just I, to quickly qualify myself as an old guy, old guy, I graduated from the University of Florida Law School, not the Levin, but the University of Florida Law School in 1968 and came here to practice with the firm of Barron and Hilton. And um, then in November, uh, I passed the bar and and December the 4th, they didn't, circuit judges didn't swear you in. Everybody went to the uh, Supreme Court building in Tallahassee and the justices came out in their robes and everybody stood up, raised your hand, swore you in, you remember the bar. At four o'clock that afternoon, my wife, dog, and I were in Columbus, Georgia, and I was uh, at the Fort Benning and I was in, became a member of the United States Army. Uh, on, And so uh, after I, um, Uncle Sam gave me a um, all expense paid tour to the Republic of South Vietnam uh, in, um, in in June, from June 69 to June 70. When I got back, got out of the army and came back here uh, and began practicing in uh, January the 2nd of 1971. So um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the firm at that time was Baron uh, Redding and Ben's here. Um, Boggs and Burke, and um, both of them are, as I believe, are retired. So this is my 51st year of law practice. I thought that I was the longest practicing lawyer in the county until I ran into one of the other old guys in Publix <laughs> who told me that I wasn't. <laughs> that while I was off dilly-dallying around in Southeast Asia, that he had continued to practice for two years, so he had two years on me. Um, so apparently, I, I guess I'm the, the second oldest. I'll check with Franklin and see if he beat me. I, I, uh, possibly an advantage of having one of us old guys uh, speak on this occasion is that I had the pleasure and the privilege of practicing for a short period of time uh, for a year with Larry Smith and when he was a practicing lawyer, he was in a different firm than I was. Um, and then um, had the privilege of practicing before him as a circuit judge from 72 to 79 when he was on the bench here in the 14th Circuit. Um, since we're talking about professionalism, I reviewed some definitions and of the word and I found some components that kind of struck me and, and they were these, uh, commitment, confidence, responsibility, dependability, honesty, ethics, integrity, appearance, and professional presence. I saw from my own personal experience that these components of the word professionalism uh, fit Larry Smith extremely well. Again, from my own personal experience, it's very appropriate that this auspicious award for professionalism in the practice should be named for Judge Larry Smith. I got an early taste of responsibility, of the responsibility component of professionalism when I came back from the war and began my practice. Um, at that point, we, we had only the old courthouse, not the new section. We certainly didn't have this. And um, upstairs was one large courtroom. It looked like something out of To Kill a Mockingbird. You thought that Atticus Finch and Scout were going to walk in any minute when you're in there. Um, there were two judges in residence. With each one had chambers, Judge Fitzpatrick and Judge Bailey. Um, Judge, uh, I count Judge Fitzpatrick as one of the finest circuit judges I ever had the pleasure and privilege of, of, um, of, of, of practicing for. He taught me a lot about the practice of law and professionalism. And uh, one incident very early in my practice, I, I may have been the first order I took over to Judge to sign, and I gave it to him. And um, he started to sign it. I said, Well, Judge, aren't you going to read it? Before you sign it, he said, um, Bob, I expect when you bring me something to sign that it's correct, and I'm assuming it is, and if it's not, you will see what the consequences could be. <laughs> and then he said, and don't you come over here asking me to issue any writ of bullus manuris in teratitis. <laughs> and I... I said, yes, sir. And I marched that. I said, Bullis Manera's in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for anybody that's not up on their Latin, I'll talk to you after the meeting. Um, in our profession, it's always been extremely important to me to be prepared 
with the judges and with the uh, clients. That seems to fall squarely within the responsibility element of professionalism. Being prepared does take commitment and dependability, two, more, two of the more critical components of professionalism. When I began my practice in January of 1971, Larry Smith was still a partner of the firm at that time was Isler, Welch, Smith, Higby, Bryant, and Brown. I think that was the right. Their offices were situated where Julian Bob Sambathy practiced today. The firm represented the National Paper Company, St. Andrew, uh, Andrew Bay Railroad, and some other large clients. And Larry Smith did a lot of that work, as I recall. I had a few matters with him um, before he went on the bench in 72. And I can always remember that he was prepared, was a gentleman. You could depend on the fact that his integrity was beyond reproach and his word was his bond. I remember more about Judge Smith as I practiced before him and then as a circuit judge, it was only about a year in practicing. Um, at some point during the time that he was on the bench, the contract was let to add the other section of the, of the courthouse. Uh, so the judges moved to what is now the SAP house. And they, uh, when you had a hearing, you picked whichever bedroom you went into that the judge was there, and that's where their chambers were. <laughs> and that worked out okay. One of the major features of Judge Smith's service as a circuit judge, as I recall, was the fact that he insisted that his lawyers be prepared when they came to see him for a hearing or a trial. Um, if maybe if we had a, before a judge, you had a complicated motion for summary judgment or to be heard uh, and you submit your memoranda and maybe three or four lawyers go in and sit down with the judge. Um, the worst thing you want to hear is the judge come in and say, okay, what do we got now? You never heard that from Larry Smith. I can recall hearings where we would sit down with him as, as a judge in a hearing and he might open up by saying something like, right off the bat, Mr. Hughes, um, enlighten the court if you would as to why the case of Smith versus Taylor that you cite in your memorandum has anything to do with this hearing or something like that. I hope it wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, if you can ask Redding, some of them were. I think. <laughs> but, um, and, and I, you know, you knew right away that Judge Smith had read the, he'd read the memorandum. He was ready uh, as prepared as his lawyers were and that you better be ready to defend your uh, position. Um, the way that he presented himself to the lawyers was not blistering uh, them or bombastic, but rather was calm, direct, almost humble, sometimes injecting some humor into his presentation, but always demanding that you demonstrate to him that you were prepared for whatever the matter was before him. Back in the old days, um, the 70s, you know, when somebody says 1970, to me, that's nothing. And then you hear these people, some of y'all people weren't even born in 1970, <laughs> but um, back in those old days, um, we didn't have an evidence code. We didn't have standard jury instructions. We didn't have fast uh, copy machines. So by way of preparation, many times when you went to a hearing, what you did was pull down a copy of Southern Reporter and Southern Second, carry them over to the hearing and quote from them. That's always dangerous because, you know, but anyway, we did that. Um, when, I remember one time when Judge Mercer Spear was on the bench and um, one of Larry Smith's former partners, Ernest Welch, uh, came to the hearing with uh, two armloads of books, the Southern, Southern, Second, whatever it were. And he always, almost always did that, Ernest did. He carried him all the way from what's now Julie and Bob Somersey's office all the way to the courthouse. Well, after the hearing, I was last out of the, hearing room and I said something to the judge about, I said, he, Judge uh, Ernest Welch carries a bunch, brings a bunch of books over, doesn't he? He said, yes, Bob, he does. But I would warn you about the one book lawyer. And I always took two books to a hearing after that, whether it was, <laughs> no matter who the judge was. <laughs> you, we try to learn as we go a little bit. Judge Smith was on circuit bench uh, until 1979. He was appointed the first DCA, uh, where he had an extremely successful and stellar career, a uh, long career as a, as he, I think he served as chief judge for a while. I believe I argued one case before him on the first DCA back then. And um, same thing applied as it did in circuit court. 
You come to the court. Well, that does that was true of I think every case that you argued in the district court of appeal, but particularly with Judge Smith, he was ready, he was prepared, he'd read everything, and you got to be prepared with your cases and your arguments. I was um, I was at Judge Collier's investiture you know, Friday, and um, as I walked down the hall, I noticed the pictures of the of the circuit judges um, uh, on the wall, and I counted. I have. I have practiced before 27 of those circuit judges. Um, if some of y'all live long enough, you'll get to do that too. Um, we've had we've had some very, very fine circuit judges. And in the time that I was practicing before Judge Smith, when he was on the circuit bench, I can never remember a lawyer saying anything or complaining about Judge Smith's competency, fairness, judgment, he was always as prepared as, as the lawyers who came before him. I counted him personally uh, and following in the footsteps of Judge Fitzpatrick, who I still feel today was one of the finest circuit judges we ever had in the circuit. Judge Fitz and, Lair and Judge Smith were great mentors to me and other lawyers, and some of them, or a few of them are in here today, in helping us to demonstrate how professionalism would run through our profession. Today, I've tried to take some of the characteristics that seem appropriate defining professionalism and demonstrate how I was able to see personally that Larry Smith, as a practicing lawyer and judge, exhibited these characteristics. One of the attributes of Judge Smith was his intensity and focus, particularly if he was trying a case, the jury, um, not allowing outside influences to fluster him or cause him to take his focus off what was at hand. Um, I remember I'm reminded of a particular case where um, our colleague now now passed on, Jerry Gertie, and I were trying a case, uh, a jury trial to Judge Smith. And the, the trial, it was in the old courtroom um, up there that I described. And if you faced the, the bench, the uh, jury was at, to your right and then to the left were a bunch of swivel chairs that they would bring, the bailiffs would sit in them and spin around and stuff. And, <laughs> and um, then... This case was tried in December, late in December, and it was this was a Friday, and it was late on Friday, and it was the same day as the Junior Service League had their annual uh, Christmas gala ball, where everybody dressed up in the ladies in their ball gowns and the men dressed up in their tuxedos. So um, after the evidence in, the judge charged the jury. They went back in about 10 or 15 minutes, they came out. And the foreman said, um, Judge, I don't know if we're going to be able to reach a verdict this day because one of our members doesn't want to do anything but sing hymns. And that was kind of strange. But uh, Judge uh, uh, recharged the jury as appropriately and they went back. They came back in in about 10 or 15 minutes. Same problem. About that time, the doors of the courtroom, the way back in the back, opened and in walked Judge Smith's lovely wife, Lynn, in a ball gown, carrying a tuxedo on a hanger, walked down the aisle. He was charging the jury, and she hung the tuxedo up next to the bench and went over and sat down in one of the swivel chairs. Um, that third time that the jury came back, or well, after that, that time when she was sitting there, they went back and judge walked over, kissed her on the cheek, said something to her, got back on the bench. And um, third time they came back, said we're hopelessly hung, too many hymns. And so he, <laughs> I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> but, you know, if you stay in the practice long enough, you will see things that you cannot make up. You know, I promise you. Um, so, uh, that, you know, that didn't, it didn't bother him a bit. And, and he then dismissed the jury, um, declared a mistrial, uh, dismissed the lawyers, and went over and picked up his tuxedo and went back to chambers and changed. Now, I'm not sure that that story hits exactly on the point of what we've been discussing today, but it's just how I remember Judge Smith being unflappable, focused, gracious, and attentive to what goes on in the courtroom. And I think that's, that's it, it's important for, uh, to, see, to see a judge to be like that. And, you know, it, I, I guess there, there could have been, <laughs> Poor Mayor Barber was trying a case one day up there on that same bench, and he got so tickled about something, he went over backwards. 
his feet up in the air, rolling over the thing. Um, can't make that up either, but it happened. But um, that didn't mean that Larry wasn't, wasn't focused. He was, just like most of the judges that I've had the privilege of practicing for. It's, it's sort of a shame, in my view, that in particular, civil trials have sort of shrunk in number, and maybe it's because of mediation. Uh, young lawyers who want to come in the courtroom and be civil trial lawyers um, have a difficult time doing it because of the, there's so many trials that are not had today because they end in mediation. Back when Judge Smith was on the bench, um, my partner Johnny Boggs and I used to try probably five jury trials a year um, each, and um, but we had to learn how to prepare the trial. Um, I had um, I had Ben and Dempsey and to help me prepare, but we, mostly we, we had to learn ourselves how to do it. Uh, I can say that Judge Smith and, and Judge Fitzpatrick were wonderful mentors for all of the lawyers in helping them and us learn these, the process that, and, and in get, helping us get through the process of, of getting ready for a trial and, and doing and, and trying the case. That helped us to be able to exhibit maybe some of the characteristics that um, would be called professionalism. So I think this old guy's talked long enough. I hope I've given you a picture of some of the history of our circuit, the practice of law when Judge Smith was a practitioner, was one of our fine and maybe great circuit judges. I've certainly enjoyed thinking back on these times um, over the last couple of weeks, trying to come up with what I wanted to say and remembering the good times, the bad times, and remember the practice of law here with the old guys, the, the, the other old guys that were the old guys when we were young lawyers and with my contemporaries, um, many of whom have passed on. I, I wanna mention that um, one of the old guys uh, passed on Monday, um, one of my, my dear and close friend, uh, retired federal United States District Judge Richard Smoke passed away. And the, Richard and I were, were very, very close and we tried a lot. Some of those, a lot of those trials I'm talking about, we were co-defendants, we went all over and took depositions everywhere. Did, it was a, a, a very close relationship, and I'm sure that um, his family is in our prayers. Um, I hope you'll agree with me that the, that the naming this award to be given today for Judge Larry Smith was absolutely appropriate, as he, in the practice of law and as a judge, exhibited these components of professionalism as much as any judge or lawyer that I've had the pleasure of serving with. I'm going to thank you for allowing me to make a few remarks here today. It's been a pleasure being here with you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Ms. Meltzer, you were not supposed to tell him that he was an old guy, <laughs> um, from me at least. Um, uh, I did want to emphasize the importance of this award. This circuit traditionally does not give out awards. Uh, and that's why the naming of this particular award and the significance of this professionalism to which we all aspire is the highest degree of recognition an attorney can receive here in the 14th Judicial Circuit. And that's, I think, in part why we just don't hand out awards, uh, except for those that are truly worthy. I did want to give the opportunity before we begin for uh, the committee, if uh, any of you have any words that you'd like to share, and these folks have worked during the pandemic and made presentations uh, uh, during our pandemic time uh, above and beyond the call of duty. I, uh, the floor is yours if any of you wish to offer any words of wisdom. All right, again, I, <laughs> I thank you and I thank everybody here on the bench bar committee that has served, especially during these particular trying times. It is now at the, uh, the time that we move now to the presentment of this year's recipient for the Larry G. Smith Professionalism Award. And I will turn to uh, local and esteemed counsel, Mr. Ross McCoy for his remarks and presentation. May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen. Bob, you really, you are really old. <laughs> I was asked to um, make a few comments about this, the recipient this year. And uh, 
I ask Holly Smelzer, Smelzer, Meltzer, <laughs> to give me, and you know, I'm paid, I'm paid to talk. Um, I was asked by Holly to, uh, to do this, and I asked her for a copy of the, uh, the program, and she sent me a copy of the early program, and it had on there that Bob Hughes was going to be the guest speaker, and then it had the presentation, and it didn't have anybody's name on it. It simply had in parentheses, insert short, old, fat man <laughs> to make a few comments. I'm supposed to talk about the recipient's background. I'm supposed to talk about the comments that I picked up from talking to others, judges, and other lawyers in town. Uh, about this year's recipient, I'm really having a hard time not blurting the name out. I know you all know who it is anyway, but I'm going to try my best not to blurt the name out. But let me get let me go through these two these two issues with you real quick, if I can, and then we'll get right to it. This year's recipient is a native of the town of Ironton, Ohio. And if you don't know where Ironton, Ohio is, if you go to Google and you punch it in. You know, you get a map and then you get a little picture to show, you know, the background of the city, the skyline, what have you. When you punch in Irontown, Ironton, Ohio, you get a picture of a White House, period. That's it, just a White House. I looked at the map and I found that it is south of Pedro, Ohio. It is east of Hanging Rock. It is west of Coral Grove. I'm sorry, it's Cold Grove. So this year's recipient certainly came from a metropolis. Uh, he graduated from Ohio State, uh, Ohio University with a liberal arts degree. He, he then went to the University of Florida and uh, received a law degree. He was on the, uh, the law review while he was at the University of Florida. He matriculated from that and decided that he wanted to practice. And he decided that he wanted to practice uh, of all places in Port St. Joe, Florida with Cecil Coston. Cecil was, I didn't know Cecil, and Cecil was a, uh, a, a very competent lawyer, but he was a very crusty lawyer. Uh, if you knew Cecil, you knew that there were hard edges to Cecil. This recipient stayed there for a little bit, then decided to go to Washington, D.C. and practice as an assistant general counsel with a large uh, insurance company and financial company. And as he put it, I had a big desk and a gorgeous secretary and very little work to do. He then came, came back to the Panama City area, and instead of going back to Port St. Joe, he opened the smallest, the world's smallest law office in Springfield, Florida on Highway 22. It is not much larger, it was not much larger than this podium here, and I think that uh, the word is that it at one time served as an oyster bar. <laughs> a few times that I, I visited the recipient in this office, I often wondered if the bathroom was at the convenience store next door. And I'm not sure that I was wrong with that. The only thing that I can really remember about the, about the small office is that it was always packed. He always had a lot, of, a lot of clients there. He then moved his office to the greater Panama City area and had a general practice and in fact added a couple of lawyers with him. Now in, in Springfield, he had Judge Sermons, Don Sermons as his first associate. And uh, obviously there was something that, that uh, this recipient's background uh, had that led to uh, having, led to a really good circuit judge and judge sermons. But he, he came to Panama City, the Panama City greater area and opened a practice in a smaller, I say smaller, a larger uh, office. And when he did, he practiced a general practice and that's where I had my main contact with him. It was in a general civil trial practice that was pretty varied. He added two lawyers to his mix. Uh, one was uh, Alvin Peters and Cecile Schoon came along too. And they entered a, into a general practice together for many years until Alvin and Cecile decided that they wanted to go out on their own. Around this time in the mid eighties, this recipient made a decision to focus primarily on family and marital law. He went in 1991 at uh, whatever age that is, he went and uh, studied for and took the certification course for marital and family law and passed it and, it and has retained that certification ever since 1991. For those of you who don't know, to keep your certification as a, a uh, certified lawyer in the state of Florida, you have to be recertified every five years. That includes getting recommendations from people that you practice with 
and people that you practice against. And Carol's, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> the recipient's practice was, it is, is and was a, a, uh, a difficult practice. Uh, it's tough to be, it's tough to represent those kind of people. It really is. So when you get, when you get the opponents to say good things about you every five years, that says a whole lot. So after that, he, he continued his practice solely, and he is now a longstanding member of the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, which is a big deal to those who do this kind of work, especially those in Florida. He was also one of eight members of the bar, including judges and law professors, who drafted the initial, the initial bounds of advocacy that was used by that is used by Florida family lawyers for promoting professionalism within that that practice. It's been updated, but it continues to set the standard for professionalism in that regard. He and his family, especially his wife, have given assistance to those uh, less fortunate and disabled. and And he also received one of the earlier. 14th Circuit Pro Bono Awards back in 1984. So he received the Florida Bar Pro Bono Service Award in 1984. He has, as, as he gave it to me, he said, I've served three tours on the Grievance Committee, two of which he served as the chair. And he's also been on the bench and Bar Professionalism Committee that was created some time ago, not that long ago. And uh, I've served on that with him as well. Okay, of course, I'm talking about Carol McCauley. It's not a secret anymore. So I've given you his background. Let me, let me tell you what others say about him. I contacted a number of lawyers. I contacted some judges, uh, some of whom want to be acknowledged, some of whom don't really care, but don't, probably don't. But let me just read to you a few things that they've said. One of them, a practicing lawyer that he practices against, says, Carol subscribes to the principle that it is a sin to be offensive. This is difficult to do in his practice. He's able to refuse to present unrealistic arguments to the court. He refrains from distorting or otherwise misstating facts or law to the court. He is a mem the only member of the American Association of Matrimonial Lawyers in the 14th Circuit, and he's been board certified for years. He promotes civility by example, which is correct. He supports numerous charities, which is also correct. And he has maintained a practice at the highest level for years and contributes to the education and mentorship of younger lawyers. He does not waste the time of his colleagues or the court to satisfy the personal obsessions of his clients. And he, this is a difficult area. Carroll exercises independent judgment, which is not governed by his clients who often have ill will against one another and to some extent deceit in the family law cases that he has to deal with. Another lawyer says Carol is a pillar of the family law community, remains one of the most knowledgeable attorneys in that area of the law, offers freely his, his guidance and expertise to younger lawyers, is happy to serve as a mentor, and displays all the characteristics of the classic Southern gentleman. One of those that I did talk to, he said he, I could use his name, is one of his biggest opponents, Jerome Novi in Tallahassee. He no longer, I think Carol ran him out of business. Uh, he no longer practices on a regular basis. But Jerome told me, please tell the, the members he, is, he does things in such a fashion where it is never personal. He is always smart, the smartest guy in the room. He is always diligent. He will give you no quarter, but he is transparent. He will never lie to the judges. He will never lie to the lawyers. He will never lie to his clients. He takes hard cases, and he's a good advocate, but always professional, always respectful with everyone that's in the process. You know, I'm not sure. Graham, I think you told me I could talk about this. So I'm going to talk about this. Graham Clark, I talked to Graham Clark as well. Graham told me many of the same things that Jerome Novi did. And he added a specific instance where he and he says that he and uh, Carol were lamenting the fact that in this area of the law, there are a lot of bullies. There are a lot of people that are difficult lawyers to get that are difficult to deal with. Uh, it just makes life miserable. And he said that the, we got, they were talking to the point where Graham said, you know, I'm not even sure I want to practice in this area much longer. 
And Carol's response was, those people operate on the dark, in the dark side and they're good because they do it all the time. Uh, but we're never going to be that way. And so we won't be as good as they are in that regard. But the only thing we can do is to try to do what we can to practice as we believe is appropriate for our best interest, the best interest of the court and the best interest of the clients. Talk to Judge Overstreet. Judge Overstreet said he didn't have much of a practice uh, as a judge with Carol, but he did practice with him uh, briefly before he became a, a circuit judge. He said every time he was with Carol, he, was, he saw Carol who was a conscientious lawyer, a great advocate, one who personifies civility just as Judge Larry Smith did, and always quite the gentleman. I called and talked to Alvin Peters and Alvin gave me many of the same uh, accolades that I've just given to you from others, but he also noted that one of the most professional things I saw him do was to step back from his general practice and challenge himself in his late forties or early fifties become board certified as a family law expert. He remains board certified to this day and it's an example to all of us of an enduring commitment to the highest standards of legal excellence and dedication that justifies Carol's receipt of this award. Now, those are things I was supposed to tell you. Give me about another minute and I'll, and I'll be through here. Let me get through this. Carol is a, is a good lawyer. And to me, a good lawyer is, is the highest uh, accolade that I can give. There's a lawyer in Tallahassee named um, Dino Kitchen, great trial lawyer, great person, uh, very dedicated to the practice of law. He, he issued a, and wrote a, a, an article that's decades old now, it's probably 30 or more years ago. And in it was, he was lamenting uh, about the fact of the practice of law and how it had deteriorated. And one of his lines in there was, you don't have to be an ass to be an advocate. Now, Carol, you may think that's not much of a compliment, but it is, I mean it that way. More recently, I went to Tallahassee with the ends of court and Justice Curiel, the, Lord, the newest justice there, in an effort to revive the, an era of professionalism, reminded us that yes, the, the rules of ethics provide that you are supposed to be a zealous advocate, but you're not supposed to take shortcuts. You're not supposed to punch people below the belt. You're not supposed to uh, create unnecessary conflict. And you know, th this courthouse, People think of it, I've, got, I've had one client who refers to it as the house of pain. People think of this courthouse as, some, as a place where you go for gladiatorial combat. It's not supposed to be that way. And Carol shows us why. Good lawyers exhibit the traits of those that I just told you about from other lawyers and judges who have talked to me about Carol. Uh, the goal of a good lawyer to me, and I think Carol's a good lawyer, is to assist clients with problems and to do it in a way without adding angst, without adding conflict, and he does that. So please, now that it's no longer a secret, <laughs> please join me in welcoming this year's recipient of the Larry Smith Professional Award, Professionalism Award, Carol McCauley. Well, Ross, thank you. You never disappoint. Members of the bench, my dear family, my friends and colleagues, while I don't consider myself deserving of this award, I am extremely proud to be part of the tradition of carrying on the memory and honoring the memory of Judge Larry Smith and what he brought to the profession. Like Bob, and I think to some extent Ross, although he didn't mention it, I had the opportunity and the privilege to practice before Judge Smith on 
a fairly frequent basis when I first came to town. Uh, I was a lawyer of around two years experience back then, maybe three. And I appeared before Judge Smith again on a pretty regular basis. And I can echo some of the things Bob said about him. Um, Judge Smith was extremely, very well prepared for every court appearance. Judge Smith asked a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Uh, and <clears throat> Judge Smith expected the lawyers to be prepared. <clears throat> And I can remember walking away from some of those court appearances before Judge Smith and asking myself, why didn't I know that? Uh, or why didn't I think of that? And so after doing that a couple of times, um, it kind of made me uh, want to ask myself in advance, you know, what else I might need to know and what else I might think about. So that when I appeared before him again, uh, I wouldn't have such a, um, uh, a sense of not really being where I needed to be with my case. So in a nutshell, here's what Judge Smith did for us, Bob. Judge Smith, Judge Smith made us better lawyers, uh, and, and that's a big deal. Now, I also got to know Judge Smith just a bit. After he retired, I would see him in social settings of one sort or another. And in thinking about what I would say today about my recollections of Judge Smith and about, about how I've approached my job, um, I imagined a conversation with Judge Smith. I imagine having a conversation with him in some relaxed setting, not a courtroom or a courthouse, of course. And I imagined it beginning with Judge Smith saying to me, Carol, uh, tell me what you're doing in your practice that promotes professionalism. And I would have said to him, well, Judge, you know, I, I never got to where I could call him Larry. Um, I would have said, well, judge, um, whenever I appear in court, I always give genuine respect to every judge I appear before and not just with words and judge, I do the same thing with their assistance, their judicial assistance. I do the same thing with the clerks. I do the same thing with the bailiffs and the court reporters and everybody else in the system. And judge, you may know that I'm a divorce lawyer. And as such, I find myself from time to time all too reoccurring, dealing with pretty high conflict situations. I find myself dealing with uh, people who are experiencing pretty difficult situations and I find myself dealing with lawyers who um, uh, are sometimes a little combative. So uh, whenever I enter a case, the first thing I do is I look for ways to lower that level of conflict. I reach out to the other lawyers when I can and try and establish a working relationship with them. I um, try uh, to get my clients to uh, conduct themselves in a uh, pretty mature and responsible fashion. Uh, that's sometimes pretty heavy lifting, uh, but I give it a try. So I try my best uh, to lower the conflict in these situations. And I never, and I can say this with some confidence, I never do anything to intentionally increase the level of conflict. <clears throat> I just don't do that. I'm not a um, double downer, you know. Um, I try and always remind myself I may not be right. You know, I don't reflect a lot on that, but it's always in the back of my mind. You know, I might not be right about one fact or another, and I may not be right about 
the law in this particular case. And also with regard to my opposing counsel, I try to be respectful to them, cooperative, accommodating, always civil. But here's the, um, you know, the candor that goes into those remarks that I just made. I haven't always been that way. Um, in fact, for about 30 years, uh, I had my share or more of legal food fights. I had my share or more of using intemperate language. And I did that. And I don't feel so good about it, but that's the way it was. But something happened and I don't, I can't really say what it was, but something happened about 15 or 20 years ago. And again, I have no recollection of what it was. But starting back then, um, I started trending up, you know, from that behavior. I started moving up and beyond some of that kind of behavior. And so now um, I actually have, uh, in my estimation, uh, cordial even relationships with many of my opposing counsel. So, um, Judge, I would say to Judge Smith, um, I also, you know, try out of respect for the judges, I try to come to court prepared. Um, I try to argue my cases within what I understand the law to be and what I understand the, you know, the facts to be. And I also, to the best of my ability, I try and give the judges some some alternatives or some workable solutions rather than just handing them some hard choices. Uh, I know they make hard choices, uh, but I've always had this idea, this thought that maybe they don't like making hard choices. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe if you give them a chance, they'd rather, rather choose between a couple of workable alternatives. So, so I do that. Now, if I'm talking with Judge Smith along these lines, I am pretty much done with what I have to say. And I, I can see myself uh, looking at Judge Smith, who's been taking all of this in. And I can see him looking at me and knowing him a bit like I did. I can see him saying, and that's it? <laughs> oh, that's all? <laughs> and I would say to him, Yes, Judge, that's all, but, you know, I'm still a work in progress, uh, and I'm trending up. So, you know, what I have come to think about from uh, receiving this award and thinking about Judge Smith and thinking about my own career is something I can pass on to the bench, something I can pass on to the bar, and that is while we're well, few of us, if any, certainly not me, will ever rise to the level of being uh, a professional like Jed Smith. All of us, and in his memory, can all be trending up. Thank you all so much. Judge Patterson. Judge McCauley, I think we probably, or Mr. McCauley, I think we need to have you take this with you. Judge. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Could we, Mr. McCauley, McCauley, we come up and we'll get a picture of both of you with this award? Because both of you have been so important here in this circuit. Carol, you got to stand in front of me. Uh, she needs, yeah, she needs no way to go to Right.
day. Ladies and gentlemen, certainly I, I mm -hmm. hope that you will extend your uh, congratulations and your thanks to Mr. McCauley, as well as Mr. Hughes and Mr. McCauley, and those that uh, share the rich tapestry in this circuit. We lose that with so much texting and emailing and just shooting by quickly without stopping to really ask how somebody is doing or how their practice is going. And so it is these types of events that helps us to remind that uh, we are all in uh, the same one practice of law and that we do need to advance it as we go forward in our careers and in our lives as well. Thank you very much for being with us. And again, a hearty congratulations. We will uh, have a plaque that memorializes Mr. McCauley out in the hallway in the uh, court uh, annex and it will hang there uh, with the other recipients of this award going forward. There is, as I'm being told, uh, a brief reception out in the hallway as well for drinks and, and whatnot. So again, thank you for being with us and I bid you all a good day. Thank you.